Great Scenes from Great Plays, with your host, Walter Hamden, and starring tonight, Miss Jean Tierney, in The Enchanted Cottage. On behalf of the families of the Protestant Episcopal Church in your own community and the Episcopal Actors Guild, we welcome you to another half hour of great scenes from great plays, transcribed by famous artists of stage, screen, and radio. And now I present your host, the distinguished actor manager, Mr. Walter Hamden. Thank you, and good evening. Tonight, we have one of the most charming love stories to be written in the past 50 years. We've often heard the expression, love is where you find it. And I suspect we could go on to say, where there is love, there is beauty. I'm sure that Arthur Wing Pinero, who wrote The Enchanted Cottage, had these thoughts strongly entrenched in his mind when he sat down to write this story of two disillusioned young people who fought their way to happiness. Here to play the role of the kindly Laura Pennington is the beautiful and talented screen star, Miss Jean Tierney. Thank you very much, Mr. Hamden. And I'd like to thank the Episcopal Actors Guild for inviting me to join you tonight. I don't know when I've had an opportunity to play the part of so forthright and sincere a person as Laura Pennington, but more especially, I can't tell you how wonderful it is to have you join us in the role of Major Hillgrove. Well, thank you, Jean. Now, let's raise the curtain. Starring Jean Tierney as Laura, with Richard Waring as Oliver, in The Enchanted Cottage. Whenever Laura Pennington came to call on me... I promised myself I would not again use the word kind to her. Though I am blind, I knew she was plain to the point of ugliness. And I knew that when I used the word kind, I was using a word which other men used for lack of anything else to say. And that it hurt her deeply. This afternoon, I again made my resolve as she came to my cottage on the lonely English countryside. Now come in. Come in. Good afternoon, Major Hillgrove. I'm sorry if I'm late. Please, Miss Pennington, it's very kind, uh, good of you to come and read to me so often. It's good of you to let me come. I look forward to it so much. You read exceptionally well. You have a charming voice. Oh, do you really want me to read to you today? You're nervous because I paid you a compliment about your voice? Oh, no, I mean... Yes, I mean... Well, I'm not used to compliments, Major Hillgrove. But I have another reason for not reading. Let me assure you, I'm not a spendthrift with compliments. Now, what is this other reason for not reading? It's a beautiful day out. I'm certain you'd like it, and I... And I have a suggestion besides. Mm -hmm. For what? Have you heard of Mr. Ashford, the young man who's just moved into the old cottage on Lord Wisborough's land? Ah, oh, yes, another war veteran, I understand. A more recent war than mine. Wouldn't you like to call upon him? He's terribly lonely. I talked with his housekeeper, Mrs. Minette, down in the village. He was rather severely injured, wasn't he? Oh, yes. And he shut himself up away from everyone. Mrs. Manette fears he'll lose his mind if he continues like this. He doesn't sleep, she says. Doesn't eat. He limps up and down his room all night. She can hear him. Yes, yes, I understand. You are kind, Miss Pennington. Very thoughtful. Well, let's go and see Mr. Ashworth, shall we? Mr. 
Mr. Ashforth. Mr. Ashforth, sir. Well, Mrs. Minette, what is it? You've got visitors coming up the lane, sir. Have my mother and stepfather dared to hunt me down so soon? No, sir. It's Miss Pennington, the village schoolmistress, and Major Hillgrove, your neighbor. Coming for a cozy chat, no doubt. Isn't it bad enough limping around this cottage without people here staring at me, pitying me? Mr. Oliver, you'll find Major Hillgrove most understanding, sir. Why shouldn't he be? He's not crippled as I am. He lost his eyesight in the last war. That's Miss Pennington's knock, sir. She's very plain and very gentle, sir. Won't you ask them in? If you want me to. No, don't trouble. I'll go to the door myself. You'd better bring some tea, Mrs. Minette. Yes, sir. At least it'll stop that girl from chattering her silly head off. More tea, Miss Pennington? Oh, no. No, thank you, Mr. Ashford. Come, you haven't said a word in the past 20 minutes. Uh, And you know, Ashford, I had quite a time persuading her to bring me. Why, Major Hillgrove? I think she's been listening to the villagers' tales about your housekeeper being a witch. It's cruel the way they treat her. But it endears her to me. It keeps people I don't want to see at a distance. Oh. Why, Miss Pennington, are you angry? They've persecuted her as they persecuted her grandmother, whom they ran out of town. I think it's unkind of you to speak of her as you do. You must believe me, Miss Pennington. I'm devoted to Mrs. Minette. And so am I, Miss Pennington. You've taken me too seriously. Tell you what I'll do. I'll go out and apologize to Mrs. Minette in person. Oh, that's not necessary. (laughs) The truth of it is I want to talk to the old lady. We've exchanged many a word at the village store. Oh, uh, which way is the kitchen, Ashford? Uh, This way, Major. Do you like my humble cottage, Miss Pennington? Oh, it's almost like an enchanted cottage. I've often wondered what it was like inside. It's rather ironic, my being here. Why do you say that? Well, this is part of the old manor house where young couples spent their honeymoons. It was the custom from time immemorial for them to scratch their names here on this window. Oh, just imagine the happiness that has begun here. The lovely ladies, the handsome men. That's why it's ironic, my being here. You'll be all right someday. I'm sure you will. I'll never be all right. I'm through. Washed up. Finished. Even the specialist I saw after I left the army told me that. Oh, but that doesn't make it right for you to hide yourself like this. I don't care for anyone. I don't want pity. Oh, forgive me for talking like that, Miss Pennington. It's it's this black headache of mine. Have you nothing to take for it? Nothing helps. I have them day in and day out. Not even finacetin? Doesn't that help? Well, sometimes... You haven't any in the cottage? No, I haven't. I'll bring you some from the village as soon as I've taken Major Hillgrove home. Well, uh, Miss Pennington, if Mr. Ashworth's mother and stepfather are coming, we'd better be on our way. Oh, of course, Major. But first, I do want to say goodbye to Mrs. Minette. Miss Pennington's the most thoughtful young woman. Yes, she's very kind. But will you please ask her not to bring me that... Phenacetin from the village. Oh, she's running an errand for you. I eh? didn't ask her to. You might as well try to call yesterday back, old chap. She's amazing. Poor as a church mouse, plain as a fence, but one of the best. How do you know she's plain? Instinct. You're right, she isn't beautiful. (laughs) What a pair we'd make. You will come again if I'm still here. Still here? I thought you'd leased this cottage for a year. I have, but you see, my mother and stepfather want me to come back to London and... Oh, why should I trouble you with my worries? I'm growing very tired of urging you to come back to London, Oliver. You must make an effort to face your friends again. Nothing is done without effort. Please, Mother, my mind's made up. I'm going to remain here. Just because you've suffered misfortune in the war? Why, when I sprained my ankle, did I allow that misfortune to distress me? Did I, Rupert? Oh, no, no, my dear. No, indeed. Do you hear what your stepfather says, Oliver? Oh, Oliver, 
You're so unlike the little lad who used to tuck his tiny hand in mine. I dare say I've been through a war, Mother. You won't come back to London and live with us where we can take care of you? No, I've taken a lease on this cottage for a year. And Lord Wisborough says I may have it as long as I like. Very well, then. We must do what we can for you under the circumstances. Ethel thought you might act like this. Ethel? What has she got to do with it? Your sister adores you, Oliver. She's quite willing to come here and take care of you. I don't need Ethel or anyone to take care of me. Do you think your stepfather and I, for one second, would let you stay here with no one but that old witch to care for you? Mrs. Minette is the kindest friend I have. She certainly doesn't take care of you. Look at your shirt. There's a button loose already in your meals. You... You're a poor, sick boy, Oliver. And I'm sure Mrs. Minette never heard of properly balanced meals. Mother. No, not a word. Ethel will be on her way very soon. Huh? Oh, hello, Miss Pennington. Were you asleep? I was just sitting here, thinking. I've brought you phenacetin. You're, you're very kind. Thank you. Not at all. Good afternoon. Oh, I, I say, Miss Pennington. Yes? Miss Pennington, I shall have to leave this cottage. Leave it? Why? Well, my mother and stepfather insist on sending my sister here to take care of me. I want no one, no one. Mr. Ashworth. Well? I, I hope you won't be angry with me for offering you advice. That you won't think I'm presuming upon our slight acquaintance. Not I. You mustn't be unjust to your sister. She must love you to be ready to exchange London for this village. Oh, it's dreadful you should have no companion. On a wet day and in the evenings, no one to read to you and talk with you. Often and often during the rough weather when the wind was roaring in the chimney and the fire hissing in the rain... I've pictured you here alone, and I... I I'd better be going. No, don't go yet. Oh, but I've got Fancy to you're have... thinking of me like Please. that. Please. Listen, don't be startled by what I'm going to propose to you. I'm deeply touched by your thinking of me in this way. Oh, please, Mr. No, you, you, you must listen. You seem to understand my loneliness, how desperately wretched I feel at times. We're both in the same boat. Miss Pennington, will you give up your lodgings and move into my cottage? We'll be married, and, and that would keep my silly sister at arm's length. You know so little of me. Enough to believe I'd be happy with you. Oh, there must be hundreds of smart, pretty girls in London who'd marry you. One of them would keep your people at arm's length. Look at me. A hideous casualty of the war. What an eligible husband for a pretty girl I'd make. Can't you see it's the smart, pretty girls I've gone about London with in the old days that I can't face now? I understand. You asked me to marry you, Mr. Ashford, because I... I possess the special qualification of being ugly. I'm greatly obliged. Laura, I... I... How can you? How can you? Oh, forgive me. I, I wouldn't have hurt you for the world. I'm a blundering idiot. What I meant was a, no other woman I know would have the, the compassion, the, the understanding to make me happy. I... I... Oh, I, I am sorry I've hurt you. Don't apologize. It isn't as if I wasn't aware of my ugliness. But remember one thing. Even the plainest women have their dreams. But if I thought for... Dreams of forgetfulness, of oblivion. Dreams in which they are as lovely and desirable as the loveliest and the most desirable. Dreams where they love and are loved. Remember that. And remember, too, Mr. Ashworth, that to spare them too complete an awakening is a deed of charity. As time passed, love and the magic of a lonely romantic spot played strange tricks. Laura and Oliver's lives grew closer and closer. A fortnight later, Mrs. Minette and I stood with them at their wedding. And then I didn't see them again for a whole week as they spent their honeymoon in Oliver's small cottage with its lover's window, attended only by Mrs. Minette. 
when she brought me their invitation to dinner at the end of that week, she hinted strange things. And I waited for them in their cottage that night impatiently. Where are they, Mrs. Minnett? They have just gone out for a little walk. Uh, there's a storm coming up. Oh, they'll be back before it breaks. And don't be surprised, sir, to find them greatly changed. Changed? How? Wait and see. They are happy, aren't they, Mrs. Minette? Oh, sir, such happiness the world has never seen. And... I say, Mrs. Minette, has Major Hillgrove come? Yes, uh, yes, here I am, old man. Are you prepared for the surprise of your life, Major? Uh, come in, come in, man. There's a storm coming up. Oh, it's so good to see you, Major Hillgrove. Oh, welcome home, welcome home, Mrs. Ashworth. How happy you sound. If you could only see her, Hillgrove. She's the most beautiful creature on earth. And Oliver. Major, he's even more handsome than before the war. We've changed, Hillgrove, we've changed. My face has changed completely and, and, and my leg. Listen to him walk, Major. Show him, Oliver. You hear? I... I can't believe it. Uh, what's happened? Love has wrought a miracle, Major. I, I, I don't understand. Oh, you must believe us, Major. I'm no longer poor, plain Laura Pennington. I'm the beautiful Mrs. Oliver Ashworth. I can hear you, my dear, and I know you're beautiful. <laughs> you're a gallant man, Hillgrove. Now, Mrs. Minette, what about the supper? Our first supper with a guest. It's all ready, Mr. Ashworth. It's been waiting for you to come. Oh, but first the wine, Mrs. Minette. The wine I brought. <laughs> we must drink a toast to the handsome young couple. <laughs> one, sir. We just missed the storm. Let me take your cloak, Laura, darling. I'd, I'd like to keep it on a moment longer, Oliver. Why, what's wrong? Surely you've got over your fright. Oh, Oliver, I, I am frightened. Laura, please, it's a foolish fear. You, you must forgive her, Major... She doesn't yet fully believe our good fortune. Uh, when did the change begin? The morning after the wedding. Almost as soon as we set foot in the cottage. She was at the door to greet us. Uh, Mrs. Minette? Yes, Mrs. Minette. It seemed as if she couldn't take her eyes off us. Everywhere we moved. That's when the change began. That night, when the lamps were lighted... And Oliver and I were sitting by the fire. It wasn't until then I was sure that Laura was positively beautiful. And all of a sudden, Oliver got up to trim a lamp. And he was walking straight as he does now. You see, Major, Laura thinks Mrs. Minette has bewitched us. And what do you believe? I... I don't know. I keep telling myself I'm not superstitious enough to believe in witchcraft. And, and yet when I look at myself in the mirror, when I, when I gaze at Laura, I... I don't know what to think, what to believe. That's why we asked you to come tonight. We need your help. Oh, please, Major Hillgrove. What are we to believe? I would say, believe in it. Believe in it with all your hearts. Take the gift and enjoy it without question. Take it without question and without apprehension that you will ever be robbed of it. Accept it humbly as a heaven-sent miracle... And thank God for it on your bended knees. Here is the wine, Major. And the homecoming supper is bursting the kettles in anxiety to be on the table. Oliver! Oliver, dear! Are you home? Great heavens, it's Mother. Oliver, my dear boy, we just got your letter yesterday. Hello, Oliver, my boy. Company, I see. Oliver, I didn't. Why didn't you postpone your wedding until your stepfather was over his grip? It wasn't very filial of you to marry this lovely, lovely girl and, and not even say a word until afterwards. Mother, mother, please. Mother, I want you to meet my guests. Mrs. Minette, you've met before. Indeed, I have. And Major Hillgrove. Oh, yes, you poor, poor Major. Oliver mentioned you. And this, this is Laura. How do you do, Mrs. Smallwood? How do you do? And now, Oliver, dear, where is she? Where is this glorious, charming creature you've written us about? Yes, where, where is your wife, Oliver? Oh, Oliver, Oliver. This is my wife, Mother. This is Laura. Oh, you? Laura? What? How do you do, my dear? What's wrong with you, Mother? Aren't you going to say anything nice even to me? Oh, well, Oliver... Of course, I... you can't judge the change in Laura, but, but what about me? 
Sir, you, you'd hardly believe that I'd once been badly wounded, would you? Would you, sir? Well, I, I must say, my boy, you do seem to have a bit more color. Yeah, definitely a bit more color. More color? What about my neck, my leg? Watch me. See how I walk now. There. Don't you believe in the miracle now? Yes, Oliver, it's, it's very nice. Very nice. Quite, quite remarkable. What's wrong with you? Don't speak to me as you'd speak to a sick person. Why do you both stare at me like this? Oh, Oliver. Oliver, don't you understand? Understand? Understand what, Laura? It's all over. Our miracle. The outside world has come in and shattered our dreams. The magic spell is over. Mrs. Manette! Mrs. Manette! Here, somebody, help me. Mrs. Manette has fainted. Have they gone? Yes, as soon as the storm passed. How's Mrs. Manette? She's resting. But I don't know. She won't let me send for a doctor. Major Hillgrove's with her. Darling, don't sit there all hunched up with your head in your hands. Please, please look up at me. Smile at me, darling. I need it so. I need you, Laura. Sit down here beside me. Can you forgive me, Oliver? Forgive you? For what, my dearest? For deceiving you? For making you believe I was pretty? For... Oliver, why are you staring at me so? You're... You're looking as you did before they came. You're, you're beautiful again. Let me turn up this lamp and look at you. Oliver, you're... You're not limping. Not limping. Of course, is not limping. Mrs. Manette, you shouldn't have left her get out of bed, Major. She uh, has something uh, she wants to say to you both before it's too late. Tell them, Mrs. Manette. I know you believe now I must be a witch, Mr. Ashworth. But it is untrue. It's quite untrue. I'm sorry for the torment of mind I've caused you both. I've known all along that sometime you would have to face an outside world. A world that misunderstands because it does not know what love does. And when they came tonight and said such harsh, unkind things, it, it broke me. And yet, I have nothing to be sorry for. Nothing to be sorry for. The Major understands. Shall we let you in on a little secret? Oh, yes. Yes, tell us quickly. You love each other. You, Laura, and you, Oliver, love each other. And a man and woman in love have a gift of sight that's not granted to other folk. We've watched you. We've watched you from the beginning. And on the day of your wedding... We saw your love blaze up like dry kindling wood when you set a match to it. Keep your love burning. Keep it burning. And we promise you that no matter what comes, you'll never be anything to one another but fair and bonny. <laughs> That's all the witchcraft there's been. Laura... Laura, my darling. Yes, Oliver? They're right. You'll always be beautiful to me. I'll... I'll always love you, Laura. And you, Oliver. You'll always, always be handsome to me. For I'll always love you. Remember what Major Hillgrove said earlier tonight? Yes, I remember. Take the gift of love and enjoy it without question. Take it without question and without apprehension that you will ever be robbed of it. Accept it humbly as a heaven-sent miracle and thank God for it on your bended knees. Mm -hmm. 
Ladies and gentlemen, I'll be back in a moment with a word about next week's play. But first, an important message I know you will want to hear. No matter who you are or what you do, no matter how difficult your problems or how great your handicaps, you can make your life far happier, far more complete, if you let the example of Laura and Oliver in tonight's tender play be your guide. Yes, these two lonely people found beauty, happiness, and security, in spite of their physical handicaps and the bitter circumstances of their lives. They found new hope in the midst of the darkness and gloom that come when the heart is empty, when disillusionment and cynicism rule the mind, when it sometimes seems that life itself isn't worthwhile. Well, of course, it's not easy to follow the example of Laura and Oliver. It's not easy to create a living harmony that's stronger than all the discords, disappointments, and confusions of our modern world. That's why a good friend can often be so important in helping you out of the shadows of disillusionment and discouragement. Just as that gentle soul, Major Hillgrove, in tonight's play, helped Laura and Oliver find the way, so have millions found their way through the friendly, sympathetic help of the church and of an experienced clergyman. Yes, millions have discovered through the church how to live a complete and truly satisfying life, regardless of personal handicaps, and in spite of all the tension and frustrations that fill their lives. Many of you listening in tonight know from your own experience how much the church can do to help you meet the problems, the stresses and strains of modern living. If you are not a member of any church, we urge you to think carefully now about discovering just how much more complete your life can be when you receive the spiritual guidance that only the church can give. Or perhaps you'll be able to find the help you need in the Episcopal Church. You are always welcome at your nearest Episcopal Church, and its clergyman is always ready and eager to give you whatever help you may require. To help you know something about the Episcopal Church, what it is, what it stands for, and how it offers you a faith with which to find security and happiness in these difficult times, we have prepared an informative booklet called Finding Your Way. It'll be sent to you promptly if you'll simply write your name and address together with the words Finding Your Way on a postcard and mail it to the station to which you are listening. I would like to thank our cast, and especially you, Gene Tierney and Richard Waring, for an inspiring performance. Our music was composed and conducted by Nathan Kroll. Next week, friends, the families of the Protestant Episcopal Church in your own community and the Episcopal Actors Guild will present an old favorite that I know you'll be happy to hear, J.M. Barry's charming play, What Every Woman Knows. Our guests will be Miss Gertrude Lawrence and Mr. Dennis King. I hope you will join us. Dean Tierney appeared tonight through the courtesy of 20th Century Fox, producers of Apartment for Peggy. Now, an invitation from the church. The rector of your nearest Episcopal church will be happy to have you join his parish family. Why not attend church this coming Sunday and speak to him after the service? If you are not familiar with the location of your nearest Episcopal church, 